This week on Quality Digest Live, we chat with Joby George of Sparta Systems about improving quality and efficiency through supplier collaboration. Plus a pair of stories looking at how to make lean work. That more when we come back. This episode of Quality Digest Live is brought to you by Mitotoyo America. Whatever your metrology challenges, Mitotoyo supports you from start to finish. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for September 23rd, 2016. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief, Dirk Ducharme. Mm -hmm. ah. The poor ampere. Ah, poor ampere. That's poor right. Little thing. Poor little thing. Poor little amp. Poor little amp. According to the article, counting down to the new ampere from NIST, the ampere has long been a sort of metrological embarrassment. I mean, for one thing, its 70 year old formal definition, this is the formal definition of the amp, uh, cannot be physically realized as it's written. Here's what the formal definition of the amp is. Now, listen carefully. There's a couple little gotchas in here. Okay. The ampere is that constant current which, if maintained in two straight parallel conductors of infinite length, of negligible circular cross-section, and placed one meter apart in a vacuum, would produce between those conductors a force equal to two times 10 to the minus seventh Newton per meter of length. And I kind of think it's the infinite length and <laughs> negligible circular cross-section that would be a little difficult to produce. Yeah, I mean, it, you kind of go to so the NIST goes to their, you know, to their guys and say, okay, we need a conductor. Ah, no problem. How long? Uh, can you make it like infinite length? <laughs> uh, sure, no problem. Uh, how big? Uh, well, the cross section's got to be like, you know, infinitesimally small. Yeah, I'll have it to you tomorrow. No problem. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah, so it doesn't quite work. So. And the problem with this is that the, the amp is also only the only electrical unit in the seven base SI units. So uh, you would think that it being the only electrical unit in uh, that all the other u electrical units, including let's say the volt and the ohm, mm -hmm. would be derived from the amp. I mean, that's the purpose of base standards. Yeah. You have these seven base standards and everything else is derived from those. But that's not the case. In fact, the only practical way to realize the amp to a suitable accuracy now is by measuring the, the nominally derived volt and ohm using quantum electrical standards and then calculating the amp from those values. So it's completely backwards, where you're using derived units to calculate a base unit. <laughs> yeah, it's not really quite what the SA guys were, SI guys were thinking of. So. This is all going to change. In 2018, the AMP is slated to be redefined in terms of a fundamental invariant of nature, the elementary electrical charge, otherwise known as E, small e. Uh, the charge of a single electron will be fixed at a value of 1.60217-ish mm -hmm. uh, times 10 to the minus 19th ampere second. So a direct amp metrology will thus become a matter of counting the transit of individual electrons over time, because that's what current or amps is. It's the flow of electrons. Count the number of electrons per unit of time or generate a specific flow of electrons per unit of time and you have amps. Yes, pretty simple. Relatively. No, no big deal. Right. So one promising way to do this is with a nanoscale technique called single electron transport or SET, SET pumping. It's specially adapted at NIST for the application. It involves applying a gate voltage from uh, the application <laughs> Let me get this right. Mm -hmm. Application of a gate voltage that prompts one electron from a source to tunnel across a high resistance junction barrier and into an island made from a microscopic quantum dot. And without going into a lot of details, <clears throat> Uh, which are really covered in the article, what this instrument allows scientists to do is to count electrons over time. Actually, they're, they're controlling single electrons at a particular rate or frequency. In this way, they can generate an exactly known quantities of current with an uncertainty of about one part in 10 to the eighth, which is on par with other electrical units. So mm -hmm. this is <clears throat> on a scale of what they're looking for. This is a big deal. 
uh, along with other advancements in base SI units like the, the kilogram, which we've talked about, the world very soon will be able to see all measurements traceable to physical cons uh, constants, uh, the, the mm. seven base SI units. Right. So this is kind of the, the, the last one in the chain that they've been looking to, uh, yeah. looking to, to, to finish. But I yeah. thought it was kind of funny is that they're getting, they're, 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 they're calculating a base SI unit from derived units. It's like complete, it must be, they must, guys must be pulling their hair out. Wow. Like, why are we doing this? Yeah, <clears throat> you know, I mean, I mean, to, to a certain extent, someone would look at this and say that's an incredibly myopic, you know, <laughs> highly detailed, but, but, but the SI, the base SI units, as we've talked about here, uh, and as NIST has talked about and, and published and we've covered, uh, really are important, because everything does spring off of that. Right. And, and, and throughout the course of time, there weren't really fixed Right. naturalistic standards that were traceable through time and right. never they changed. Were, they were a rod, they a were certain a rod, length, a certain they were a weight, or a weight of something, certain, yeah, and, and yeah, those things, yeah. you know, we know those yeah, things vary over time. De yeah. de you know, vary over time. Uh, and, and so this is a way that they're approaching this using the, the forces of nature, the, yeah. the natural rhythms of nature, to trace these things and be able to, to link to them. To define everything based on those. And yeah. they'll never change, and that's right. really, really important for what yeah. NIST does, because these little tiny variances make a big, de yeah. or a big deal. So good stuff by NIST as always, so thanks NIST for doing that, thanks Dirk for covering it. Okay, well, like Many of you out there in our audience, uh, we here at Quality Digest are essentially the, the sales organization. We actually just had a, had a team breakout yesterday and talked yeah. about everything yeah. that we're doing, and, and sales is a big part of that. Now, for-profit organizations, of course, need to understand that for all of the, everything that they do, for all their performance pro excellence protocols, right, their innovative product development um, systems, uh, superior strategizing and leadership, Given all that, even with all that, nothing happens to really move a company forward until somebody makes a sale, right? Until right. sales made. And that holds true whether that sale is for a, a training program or a CMM, a software suite, or as we would do, a, for an ad campaign. Uh, so it was with great interest that all of us, especially me, read the article, What We Can Learn About Sales from a Pig. That's right, from a PIG, from a pig. Uh, that was by Paul Smith of Thought Leaders. We ran the piece in Wednesday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. Now, Smith's article relates to his purchase of a photo. I want to show you this photo uh, here, because we have it, and that, that's the photo that he bought right there. I think a lot of people have seen that photo. Uh, it's probably yeah. a pretty, pretty well-known photo. As, yep. as you can see here, it's a, it's a photo of, of a piglet in the water, which is it's cute. Kind of cute. Pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty cute photo. It's probably not particularly awe-inspiring, maybe, but it's, that's, that's definitely cute, I think you would say. Kind of a cool little photo. Pigs well, may not be able to fly, but they can swim. They can so. swim, right? Who knew? <laughs> but now, this is an interesting story, though. Smith was not necessarily going to buy this photo. It was taken by a noted marine wildlife photographer named uh, Chris Goog. Uh, now, he wasn't going to buy this photo until he actually met Goog. He, he and his wife were at a uh, at an art show, okay. basically, and, and his wife is a, is a big art collector, and, and Smith's like, ah, nice picture. You know, he doesn't know as much about it. But right. um, they met Goog at this show, and, and Goog told Smith and his wife about the, the provenance of the shot, which they didn't really know about, how pigs were brought to this uh, Bahamian island by the name of Big Major K uh, many years ago by a local entrepreneur who was going to raise them for bacon, right? Raise them for food stock. Uh, now, of course, the issue with that is there's not a whole heck of a lot for pigs to eat in the Bahamas other than like cacti, and <laughs> pigs don't really like cacti, right? So there really wasn't any way to keep them fed and alive, and the idea of farming the pigs for food kind of went by the wayside and the original group of swine were, they were like dying out, right? That is, until a local restaurateur started bringing his food refuse over to Big Major K. He left it kind of just offshore, just kind of where you yeah. saw that animal right that far, that far <laughs> okay. off of shore. Right. And he let the pigs forage it, right? So lo and behold, the pigs <laughs> learned how to swim. They learned how to swim, they learned how to go out and get the food, and they grew really tame. They grew tame enough to approach incoming boats with their snouts out of the water, like you see there, looking for a handout, right? I mean, that's, that's what an animal's gonna do, or they're gonna adapt to that. And that's how bacon came to the <laughs> <laughs> But with that, with that story, that photographer, Chris Krug, Chris, Chris Krug had made his sale. He right. made the sale because Smith and his wife bought the bought the story, bought the story, picture. Yeah. They and the moral is that from well, I mean, the moral of the story, I guess, from a certain perspective, is I guess you could say that it's pretty incredible that the pigs are that adaptable uh, to, to be able to do that, and that they won't turn up their snout at some floating garbage. I mean, that's, that's one of the morals. But the bigger moral of the story really is about sales and about stories and about what that does. And, and the deal is really that 
products for sale aren't just, you know, they aren't just products for sale. They're, in a sense, living entities with stories that are connected to them. And when those stories are, are properly framed for potential buyers, the latent power of the product can emerge. Now, again, a picture of a pig in water, just a picture of a pig in water, it's cute right. and everything else, but when you get the emotional impact of a great story that goes with it that tells where that picture came from and why it exists, well, now it's a picture of a pig in the water that's also a conversation starter, it's a reference to an exotic land, and it's a, a kind of weird and funny and cool little piece of history. And all that adds weight to the product. I mean, what you and I and those of us in our audience would probably call value. Um, and remember that, that value Value isn't defined by those of us that sell something, but by those of us that by those that are buying what we want to sell. Yeah. Right? It's by defined by the customer, not the seller. So sales is ultimately about communicating that value, telling those stories, and and things like specs and price, functionality, brand equity, all those play their role in that communication. But as this article points out when a great story is connected to that product as well, all the other attributes are polished and they, they come up to a higher level of importance in the mind of yeah. the buyer. Again, not the seller, the value is in the minds of the buyer. So right. storytelling it's, is important, yeah, important all, part of sales. It's, and it's, it's all about the story. <laughs> and it it really yeah. is, and you know, I mean, it, it, yeah. it, it, it happens in, in, every, in everything we all do. It happens in politics too. I mean, we all tell stories right. to communicate what we're doing and why and why you want to have some value for something. And, and it's important yeah. to remember that. We're, we're all sales, we're all, all salesmen really at one or another. So remember that next time you're in an exchange and what you need to use your sales shops, tell a story. Makes me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I want to think of, oh, never mind. <laughs> it's no surprise to any of you out there that, uh, that manufacturing has changed dramatically during the past several years. I mean, I think most original equipment manufacturers no longer make the entire product. I think that's pretty rare. Uh, make it within their own, uh, their own four walls, that is. They, they outsource uh, not only the supplies and the components, but also sometimes the actual manufacturing and the distribution of, of finished goods. And to do this, they have to manage an increasingly more complex supply chain. And as Joby George writes in his article, Ensuring Quality and Efficiency Across the Supply Chain, all of this introduces new levels of risk due to the limited visibility into the product's life cycle. So how to create greater transparency uh, into their suppliers and contracts manufacturing operations and quality processes to ensure that products meet regulatory as well as health and safety and quality requirements is, is a big deal. I mean, you need to have visibility into this. So here to discuss uh, that topic with us is the author of the article, Joby George, a product manager at Sparta Systems who is joining us via Skype. Hi, Joby. Hey, Dirk, how are you? Oh, pretty good. Okay, so backing up just a little bit, um, you say in your article, as I said, that outsourcing not only supplies, uh, you know, and outsourcing that you're outsourcing not only supplies and components, but also the actual manufacturing and distribution of the finished goods, and this has added new levels of risk due to the limited visibility into the into the product life cycle. So, can you give some examples of what some of those risks are? Sure. Um, so the risk can be simply stated as the loss of control by the brand owner in ensuring the quality of the process. So take a look, at, if you look at the pharma industry, and according to the FDA, over 80% of the ingredients that go in a drug come from outside the United States. And according to the FDA, you, the pharmaceutical company, the brand owner, you are responsible for the quality of that product. So it doesn't matter who your suppliers are, it doesn't matter who your supplier suppliers are, you are ultimately responsible uh, for the quality of that product. And the risks are very simple, right? Uh, if something is offshore, something is coming from abroad, you have no visibility into the third party manufacturing process. You have no idea how their employees are trained. Uh, you have no idea what kind of um, process they're using internally, who their suppliers are, are and so forth. So you have complete lack of control over the suppliers and their operation. And re recently in the news, you know, we've heard of uh, events that are going on with third party suppliers. So for example, um, we've all heard about the issues going on with the Samsung telephones. The Note 7 was recalled. Um, because it was catching on fire, people were getting hurt and so forth. And when Samsung did a root cause analysis, they were able to trace the issue to a part provided by a supplier, a battery cell provided by a single supplier that was causing all these Samsung phones to catch fire and cause damage. Um, recently, also Bluebell ice cream was in, in the news recently. They had an outbreak of listeria again. And, and when they did their analysis, they were able to trace back 
the issue to a single supplier that provided cookie dough. So the supplier provided cookie dough, which for some reason was causing listeria in blue ball ice cream. So since you lose control, since somebody else is making these products for you, they're providing these ingredients for you, your product is in, uh, getting damaged. Your brand is getting damaged. Your reputation is getting damaged. And the risk is, of course, uh, growing large over time. So, no. so, the, so the, good, good. The, the 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 better the 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 better the the view you have into your su supply chain, what then the, the more quickly you can you can troubleshoot and get to the root cause of the of of the issue. Is I'm, I'm assuming what we're kind of what we're getting to here. Then, exactly, absolutely, you are correct. Yep. So if that's the case then, I mean, you talk about this lack of visibility, which Dirk just referenced and you talked about as well, and, and that I, I would assume comes in many cases from companies uh, communicating with their suppliers. They're using uh, like, like manual, maybe disconnected methods of communication. So uh, maybe the point is that we need something a little more, more automated, right? But, but just how automated are we talking about here? What, what specific kind of automation does, for instance, software, I mean, you guys are a software uh, seller, seller software. Um, what kind of automation does software bring to the table? So it's about notifying the, uh, automating the notification of a quality event. Um, if a supplier has an issue today, they have to start an email, uh, send it to their partners, add some files, type in some text, and off it goes into the ether. So software and with automation, we're talking about um, uh, improving the collaboration between suppliers and their partners when something happens. It's about eliminating the back and forth, uh, waiting, on, waiting on information from another party, versus getting all the information from the start and seeing its way through completion. Really about avoiding manual entry of quality events uh, that reduces typos, delays, and incorrect information. With software, with automation, with uh, being digital, everything is time stamped and audit trail. So the second um, a supplier or a product owner assigns you an electronic task, the clock starts. Now there's traceability the second something comes in through all the way end of a process. So let's say, for example, uh, a supplier wants to change how something is manufactured for their customers. Today they would have to email the customer saying, hey, so-and-so, um, I'm going to be using a new ingredient in my manufacturing process, FYI. With electronic and with software, they can electronically raise a ticket alert their partners and go through a workflow process where the customer and the supplier can collaborate to reduce the risk of something bad happening in the future. And the additional benefit of this, that, this is that since everything is electronic, there's full reporting and searching capabilities, which is not possible for with email today, right? There's no way to report on email, no way to trend on emails and so forth. And so with everything being electronic, it makes it very simple for both parties to know, hey, I have something going on, I'm working on it, I'll let you know when I'm done as soon as possible. Well, let, let's uh, let, let's talk about this a little bit. I mean, you mentioned collaboration and partnership and stuff, but I'm I'm assuming that if if I'm a buyer and you're 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 my you're my supplier, um, I'm probably going to dictate to you. I'm going to dictate to my suppliers that you have to use this this software. You have to use this automation that I'm that I'm using. You're, you're pretty much going to say, well, if you're going to be one of my suppliers, this is what you're going to have to do. So, what is in it for them? For the supplier, besides your business, I mean, it, it's better better to have a carrot than a stick, right? I mean, rather than force them to use it, it's like, well, use this, and it's not only going to benefit me as a as a buyer, but it's going to benefit you as a supplier in what way? Sure. I mean, both parties have to benefit, right? You want, we want both parties to be happy. So, for the, from the benefit of a supplier, uh, whether it's a supplier that makes batteries or that or that provides sugar or then makes cookie dough for an ice cream company, the benefit of supplier is that they have an access to a single application that's a one-stop shop to see all the tasks that's been assigned to them. Uh, so previously, they had to open emails from multiple partners. They lose track of who they're working with. They lose track of due dates. They lose track of documentation and so forth. Now, with a single a portal that's being provided to all suppliers, they have a one-stop shop where they can see all the tasks that are assigned to them. Uh, they can raise issues to their partners. So my previous example, when something had to be changed, uh, they can electronically raise it, they can monitor status all from a single portal. And the additional benefit is that they can also view reports to see how they're doing. So suppliers know that they're always being monitored and measured by their customers. So if I want to continue being uh, to continue to do business with my customers, I need to do a very good job of closing tickets. Now with reports and this one-stop application, 
they can view things like average cycle time. Um, it's taking me 30 days to close a ticket that uh, my customer has provided. Is that good or is that bad? I know that my customer is measuring me. So at one glance in this application, they can measure and see how they're doing so they can better themselves. And maybe in the future, you know, when they uh, when, when it's time to do co uh, renew contracts with their customers, they can use that data to say, hey, look, and I've been doing a very good job. I'm doing better than the peers in my industry and so forth. So they can leverage it in the future too. So in the end, um, by having a single software and portal, this improves a user's life. This makes the supplier job very easy. Customers are happy because they can reduce risk, they can mitigate risk. And in the end, uh, it's all about improving the life of patients, right? That's what matters. We're all trying to make quality products that's going to improve the lives of patients that, that use those products. Okay, well, Joby George, Product Manager at Sparta Systems, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, Joby and I will be presenting a webinar next week on this topic. Actually, Joby's presenting. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I'll just show up and be the host. I'll take your questions. Uh, the webinar is called Improving Quality and Efficiency Through Supplier Collaboration. Uh, that's this coming Tuesday, September 27th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. So be sure to sign up for that. Joby, thanks for joining us this morning. No problem. Thank you, guys. Have a good weekend and, uh, and go Mets. <laughs> That's right, go Mets. Go Getting Mets. out of crunch time. Thanks, Joby. We'll, we'll see you on Tuesday. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Yes, they're, they're, they're from back east. They're from New Jersey. That's, that's where I grew up, too. They're We're all Mets, Mets fans. Yeah, all right. All right, one of the joys of doing what we do here at Quality Digest, as opposed, in addition, of course, to following Mets, is publishing an insightful editorial that educates and informs and entertains, maybe even changes the way you look at business and at life. Well, two of the authors that we publish uh, do this, I think, really regularly. And in their latest pieces, they each look at lean and management in especially illuminating ways and they illuminate one another too, which is why I want to cover them both here. The Value of Depth and Detail by Kevin Meyer appeared in Monday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. You can see it right there. And then right underneath that is Bob Emiliani's article, Lean Management, is it illegitimate? Uh, lean, <laughs> lean Management is illegitimate or is it? Which ran on Tuesdays, uh, in Tuesday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. Well, again, we're covering to choose both of these pieces on the show together, and not just because they're great pieces, but because they also really reflect, as I mentioned, on one another. Um, as is his style, my Meyer's article looks at the human side of the lean, particularly the respect for people elements of the Toyota production system. I shouldn't use the air quotes there because it's, <laughs> right, it's, right. Not, it's not respect for people. No, it's true respect <laughs> for people. Um, the, uh, the respect for people elements of TPS, of the Toyota production system, and it's often missed by those that want to bypass culture and principles. We know about this all the time. They want to bypass that and go right into a tools-based approach to, to finding and fixing problems. Um, but as Meyer says, without an appreciation for detail and complexity, any fix are going to inherently be short-term band-aids. What he's saying here is that is that if you don't understand the culture of the organization in which you're working, the principles under which that organization is uh, has been founded to, to embody, then you know trying to uh, slap a short-term fix on something through a Kaizen Blitz or a 5S program isn't really going to do anything. It's not going to really change the you know move the needle or change that organization. And Emiliani hammers kind of a related point. He, he actually takes it a little further. Uh, he wonders why is business management such a well-respected and Endeavor. It is grounded in classical economic theory. It's taught to thousands upon thousands upon thousands of, of graduates each and every year in business schools. Why is that so respected? While well, lean management is considered something of a fringe movement, something of a poor, poor sister, really, with few, if any, discrete training institutions. Yet, business management, if you really look at it and think about it, is rife with like antiquated thinking and, and kind of gut level decision making, right? Uh, and lean, on the other hand, really because it was developed by industrial engineers, it carries the force of logic and data analysis and science. So one is very emotional and one is very much data driven, mm -hmm. yet the emotional one is the one that's taught in business schools and it charges tens of thousands of dollars for these right. degrees, right. These, these business management degrees. And, and, and the other is kind of like, well, you get it through, through tribal learning on, right. on site. It's kind of backwards. Well, both Meyer and Emiliani understand the power uh, of TPS, again, the Toyota production system, as it was originally conceived, comes from the combination of real human buy-in and multiple feedback loops built on real-time observation and data. There's no shortcuts. One can't pretend to honor people's ideas and contributions, and one can't pretend that guesswork and waste are legitimate ways to achieve success. Management can't say that they're embracing lean without demonstrating real commitment to this process, I think is really the moral of the story here. These two men are saying much the same thing in their respective columns, that sweating the details, as Meyer calls it, is the surest path to legitimacy 
in the words of Emiliani. You can't have one without the other, and the Japanese forefathers of TPS understood that implicitly as they built the foundations for what we now call lean, right? Unfortunately, and this is something that Meyer, Emiliani, Mike Mickelwright, a good friend, uh, has talked about many, many times and bemoaned over the years, when lean became a thing with U.S. companies a generation or two ago, executives were all about the tools. I mean, 5S is great, right? right? Mm. Check out our, our cool little Kanban cards. We've got to do a Kaizen Blitz, all that stuff. Well, it's still happening. The tools of lean are only practical and only beneficial, again, if the organization in question has established the culture and principles just to support them. If not, Lean's never gonna last and achieve the results that these interested parties really want it to achieve. So right. it's interesting that when we read these articles and we thought about them, they're really saying the same thing, that, that lean is misinterpreted and lean isn't really applied properly. And because of that, it's not really respected the way it should be. It's really a data-driven approach that also embodies humanistic principles and, and embodies the principles of respect for people within it. It's all there, but yet if you just look at the tools, and you don't have the whole package, you're never going to get all that. Well, I, I think it's, 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 that it's, it's, it's easy for people, <clears throat> managers, or yeah. maybe anybody, <clears throat> just say, oh, here's a tool, let's just use it. Right. Without the, the, the support and everything else that goes behind it, it's like, yeah. oh, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just a tool, just you know, do these calculations or use right. this software or whatever it is, but a tool without intent it's, it's, it's all, just almost meaningless, it's yeah. just a tool. It, it, <laughs> it doesn't it, do anything. It is, and that's, yeah. that's, that's the problem. That's what they're saying here. Those are both really, really good authors, yeah. two of my favorite guys that write for us, so check, check them out. Okay, well, uh, Mike and I, uh, we're at IMTS, the big uh, yep. in, uh, international uh, manufacturing uh, show in mm -hmm. Chicago last week. Great show, as usual. Plenty of new metrology equipment to look at. As a matter of fact, all sorts of equipment, not just metrology. That yeah. We looked at, but there's everything at that show. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, and in fact, we did several live tech corners while we were at the show from several vendors, including one from Nikon Metrology. We looked at their uh, MV331 laser radar system, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. But while we were at the booth, we couldn't help but notice another cool Nikon product, the HNC3030 non-contact gear measurement system. And this is a, uh, this is a very precise, high-speed measurement uh, system for complex components, non-contact measurement system, I should say, right. for complex components like uh, gears, impellers, uh, turbine blades, and that sort of thing. So it features an advanced laser scanner. And Nikon is really making a, a leap forward in ultra-fast shape evaluation compared to, let's say, more traditional tactile measurement uh, method. So since we were there in the booth and we had our cameras, we had a chance to talk to Nikon about this new product. Take a look. Okay, I'm at the uh, IMTS 2016 show and right now we're in the Nikon booth. Uh, I'm here with uh, Dennis Freimark. Do I have that right? Freimark? And we're looking at the H, uh, what, the HNC 3030 gear measurement machine. Is that right? right. Yeah. And what's, uh, well, gear measurement, uh, what else does it do? Um, well, originally this machine was, was not specifically designed for gear measurement. It's just that's where the market took off when we first started selling it in the Asian market. Um, because of the, uh, the high accuracy, high speed uh, precision measurement of the, of the gears, um, we're able to uh, measure basically the whole surface of the gear rather than just the uh, normal touch grid pattern that you can do with a, with a, um, a contact probe, a touch probe. And you, and you said high accuracy, what, what are we talking about? Um, on a general gear measurement we can reach accuracies under a micron. Okay, uh, so uh, you kind of step us through what it does. Um, so basically we have a laser scanner, it's a five axis system. Okay, we have a machine in there that moves in X, Y, and Z. We also have a rotary table that rotates infinitely and then an arm that the laser is mounted on that uh, goes from minus 20 degrees to 135 degrees. So with that we can basically measure any contour of the surface. There's also a laser mounted on that can go from minus 180 to a positive 180. So basically that is not automatic. You position that into the, uh, you put that in the position that you need it for the scan and then it'll move around the part and um, also rotate the table and scan it as needed. Okay. Uh, as you can see here we're getting uh, basically point cloud data. We're doing a general four tooth measurement. Um, that's normal in gear measurement. Uh, we can basically do a four tooth measurement on, an, on, on a gear in about five minutes. Um, depending on the type of gear, there are different types of gears. You know, we have the, the bevel gears, the hypoid gears, uh, basic um, cylindrical drive gears. Um, so on a bevel gear, uh, something like this, uh, we could measure this whole gear surface in about five minutes, all teeth. Oh, all okay. teeth? All teeth, yes. Um, it always depends on the type of gear. 
okay? On a, on a uh, drive gear, we can measure it in about, um, I believe, 40 minutes or so, all teeth, both sides. Okay. Now, I, I know we're not allowed to, to film inside there, but can you show us maybe uh, on the software what, what might be happening? Okay, right now you'll see uh, we have a video window right now. It's actually scanning the face of the tooth. Okay. Over in this window, we have a simulation of all the point clouds. If I zoom in a little bit here, I can show you that we actually do generate general uh, gear reports with the profile and lead. Okay. Um, I can also bring up a sample of a bevel pinion gear. So that's a sample of a bevel pinion gear report. We can also do the pitch between all the teeth. Okay, this is a report for all the pitch between the teeth. Now we can go back and we'll see that we have a point cloud here that is just basically a whole bunch of points as the laser scans. So we can uh, generally grab about 120,000 points per second with this laser. Um, it's very comparable to our LC15 laser that we sell on our CMMs, which is our most accurate laser that we have. So are you, are you scanning the, in, the surface of the entire gear or just uh, particular edges or how's that work? Currently, uh, how this is running, we are scanning the top of the gear and the inside of the gear to set up a datum. Okay, and then we scan both sides of four teeth to do our typical measurement. We can set it up to do the whole gear. Um, when we're doing a general pitch measurement, it does spin around and grab all gears to get the spacing between the teeth. And, and um, what, what market uh, is kind of driving this, uh, the need for this particular piece of equipment? Uh, the gear industry, mostly uh, with automotive. Um, that's where it initially took off, but it is also, I mean, it's beneficial in any gear industry. Um, I could see applications also in the uh, plastics, so small plastic gears, where you cannot measure them with contact probes because they're just too small. We can measure them with a the laser. So in our presentation here, we have a couple gears that we do, um, I believe they're about half a millimeter and 0.3 of a millimeter in size, and we're able to scan those, no problem. Those are pretty small gears. Yes, they are. <laughs> um, normally, normally your touch probe is only about 0.3 in diameter, your smallest size. Yeah. So, um, so uh, you mentioned earlier, like, uh, you could compare this to, I'm assuming you could compare this to CAD so, uh, and do like a, uh, like a color map, is, is that possible? Yes, that is possible. That'll also give you um, a, contour, a contour map. You can also, there is options for um, possibly even doing uh, a representation of gear meshing, so how the teeth mesh together. Um, the common way to normally do that is you'd probably p uh, paint up the gears with um, with, with something and then actually have them contact and it was always a visual measurement. So it's very subjective. Um, now we could do that, we could simulate it in the software and be able to do it that way. So uh, Is uh, also used for uh, reverse engineering gears by any chance? Uh, that is possible, yes. Um, uh, we would have to use a third party software to do the reverse engineering to generate the CAD file. But basically it, it uh, can export an STL file or a point cloud and then we can take that into a third-party software and generate the CAD file from that, like an IGIS or a STEP file. Okay, very good. Well, Dennis, uh, thank you uh, for okay. demonstrating. This was the HNC3030. Yes. Okay, appreciate it. Thanks. All right, thank you. Well, there you have it, straight from the floor of IMTS. Dirk, nice job there with Dennis Freemark of uh, Nikon, uh, Applications Engineer with Nikon, showing off the uh, the HNC3030. That is a 3D uh, ge gear, 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 measure, gear not measurement. Contact gear measurement yeah, system. Yeah, not contact yeah. gear measurement system. Really nicely done, Dirk. And uh, and check out our site. All the all the tech corners we did uh, from IMTS are are on our site and on our YouTube page. So so check that out. And a lot of good technology you saw yep. at the show last week. Really, really good job done by Dirk and all that stuff. All right, well, that is our show for this week. But before we go, we want to thank uh, our sponsor. Mitsutoyo Corporation is the world's largest provider of measurement and inspection solutions, offering the most complete selection of machines, sensors, systems, and services with a line encompassing CMMs, vision, form, and finish measuring machines, as well as precision tools and instruments and metrology data management software. Mitsutoyo's national uh, network of metrology centers and support operations provides application, calibration, service repair, and educational programs to ensure that their more than 6,000 metrology products will deliver measurement solutions for their customers. 
For more information, visit online at www.mittotoyo.com or click on the banner just below or just to the right of this video player page. Yeah, that's right. Before mm -hmm. we go, just remember, uh, webinar next week, yep. Sparta webinar, uh, I'll be hosting. Uh, Joby George will be presenting the material, Improving Quality and Efficiency Through Supplier Collaboration, this coming Tuesday, September 27th, 2 p.m. Eastern and 11 a.m. Pacific. Keep your and, eye on your uh, email or, or check out Joby's article. Joby's article has a yep. link out to the, the webinar as well. You can register right there. Yep. So from all of us here in Quality Digest in beautiful Chico, California, <laughs> have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Bye. Well, I think it was all right. I don't think we were. Yeah, I don't